so I was watching my daughter's kids while she and her husband go out of town. They have a teenage daughter, Alyssa, and at about 3am, I'm woken up by a weird rustling sound and look out the window and see movement. I saw a boy emerge from the bushes on the side of the house. I saw a bike tossed on the lawn that definitely wasn't ours. My first thought was that it was a burglar casing houses, but since he looked young and came through on a bike, I figured scaring him straight would be enough for him to decide to just head home. I didn't want to ruin a teenager's life by calling the cops straight away. So, I went on the porch, flipped the lights on and said, Can I help you? In my classroom voice. The guy looked surprised, but not nervous. He was wearing a Letterman style jacket, but once I got a clear view of him in the streetlights, he seemed much older than my granddaughter. Gruff and more wiry than athletic. He walked up closer to the house and said, Uh, yeah, I'm looking for Alyssa. I gave him a disapproving glare, hoping that he'd realize that he'd come looking for a girl late at night, and a grumpy old person answered, It's time to split. I'm thinking what must have happened is that Alyssa knew her parents were going out of town, and maybe before she knew that I'd be staying over, told the secret boyfriend to come over or something. It was late and I was alone with several kids, so I didn't want him coming any closer to the house. I also thought that it was weird that he came so late and wanted to be sure Alyssa actually wanted to talk to him. So I said, I'm sorry, who? And he said, Alyssa, this is her house. I thought that because he knew her full name that they must be at least friends. So I said, you wait there. But then he started to walk up and... I felt a sick burning in my gut. Instinct kicked in and I yelled, No, stop, freeze. Then readjusted and said, You stay right there. This is private property. Don't take a step closer. Wait there. So I go in and Melissa is asleep, just one room over from where the rustling first occurred, and I wake her up and say something to the effect of, Hey, I don't know what the big idea was to have friends over this time of night, but you gotta tell them to go home, alright? But she has no clue what I'm talking about. I say, What? There's a guy outside asking for you. Confused, she gets up and goes to the window. She sees him and goes white as a sheet. Wait, he asked for me? Yeah. By name? Uh, yes. You need to call the police. I've never even seen him in my entire life. I called 911 immediately, but as I was on the phone with them, Melissa started tugging at my arm. He's coming up. I had younger kids in the house to think about, so I kept the door latched and pulled it just open enough for the latch and yelled. I asked my husband and none of us know an Alyssa. Leave my property or I'm calling 911. He got angry and started yelling for her to come out. Thankfully, the police came pretty quickly and when he heard the sirens... He grabbed the bike and ran off. I watched where he was running and he jumped into the passenger side of a car without headlights or front plates and he sped off. The police followed in the same direction once I pointed them, but they didn't get him. They advised us to take all of her social media details offline if she was sure that she didn't know this person and said that they'd had a couple of similar reports recently and were looking into it. I got a heavy-duty lock after this, and she slept in my room for the remainder of my visit. I'm female, and I was 13 when this encounter occurred. This encounter happened around 2013, and I was a part of this girls-only group. We'd meet up every week and just hang out and do teenage things. There were different locations around my city, and I obviously went to the one closest to me. The building where we met, too, was at a massive local park near a lake, which made for plenty of fun times. The group was for girls aged 13 to 17, so we generally all got along pretty well. The particular group that I was in met on Thursday nights, when there was nine of us. Two were my family friends, who were also my lifelong best friends. Them and two other girls and I went to the same school. So, there was this camp every year. The goal was to do everything yourself, so we had to set up our campsite, make all of our dinners, all that sort of stuff. It was really fun, and I'd been two times previously. It's a competition as well, and our group split in two. 
Me, Aaron, Izzy and Jess, the other five girls were in another group. And one thing that we had to do to prepare was to go shopping for food, so we did that one night and spent the other few nights packing everything that we would need, like tents and portable stoves and stuff for a fire, etc. Now, my friend Aaron and I were in the same class at school, so the Friday afternoon of the camp, we left early and her mum picked us up. We live in the same street, so we got our things and carpooled there with the other girls, Izzy and Jess. The park where all the camps were was pretty massive and we stopped for pizza along the way. The first few nights of the camp went well. We stayed up all night eating candy in our tent, sneaking out and walking around the massive park, talking, playing truth or dare and never have I ever, you know, normal teenage girl things. On the last full day, we did an activity that we chose prior to going to the camp. Out of all the girls in my group, I was the only one who had chosen to do archery and I only knew two other girls from my main group and I got to know some of the other girls that I didn't know from the other groups, but during the activity, the leaders just started acting really weird. They were looking at each other, whispering and talking on their walkie-talkies. The girls I knew from our group back at home, who weren't in my group at the camp, were doing archery too. So I hung around with them and we were discussing why we thought the leaders were acting so weird. The leaders seemed to get more scared every minute too and they called us all over and told us to go into one of the buildings because we were going into lockdown. I stuck with the girls and we and some other activity groups went inside. Everyone else from the other activity groups went to the building on the other side of the park, including the girls from my group at this camp. We hung out there chatting to everyone for maybe an hour and we all talked about the camp so far and then about what we thought was going on. This one girl called Chloe said that a girl had seen a naked man with a knife walking around in the woods. And another girl named Monica said that there was a gang in the woods who knew of this girl's camp and wanted to find someone to snatch. We, obviously, were all freaked out either way. Then they offered bathroom breaks and we went in groups of four outside to the bathrooms and the two leaders escorted us. There were two cop cars outside and when I saw them, I felt really uneasy about the whole thing. We started to talk amongst ourselves but the leaders led us to the bathrooms and told us to shush. When we got into the bathroom, they explained everything. Apparently, a girl in the orienteering group, her name was Pippa, had spotted a naked man holding a knife, so Chloe was correct. They told us that it was all going to be okay and that the cops were searching. They called everyone's parents and the police finished their search and when this was done, one of the cops came into our building and said that they got the guy and we were all safe. We were let back to our campsites and when I saw my friends from the other building back at the tent, I hugged them and they asked if I was okay and I asked them the same. Fortunately, nobody was hurt, but the girl who saw the man, Pippa, went home and was obviously pretty traumatized. We were supposed to cook our own dinners that night on the fire, but to celebrate, the leaders ordered a crapload of pizza, soda, and fries for us to just have a massive feast with. We were all scared as hell that night, and we didn't sneak out of our tent like we had the other nights, because even though the guy had been arrested, we were all still pretty creeped out. The next year, there was this girl in my class named Hannah. I found out that she was part of this same girls club that I was in, but from another location in my city. I slightly recognized her after she told me this, and I brought up the incident at the camp from the previous year, and she was at that camp too. And she was actually a part of the orienteering group that saw the guy, and she confirmed that he indeed was naked and holding a knife. I'm guessing that he must have been on something, but... It was still creepy as hell. When I was around five or six, my family and a family of friends all went camping together one summer in New Hampshire. Each family had a camper and we all set up at one campsite. The campground had a playground, a lake nearby and there was always something going on. But one day too, me and my friend Kelsey, who was around the same age as me, were playing outside on our campsite as our mums talked outside the camper, keeping their eyes on us. At some point, an old man came walking by our campsite. He seemed like a normal guy, according to my mum, but then he started to walk up and started a conversation with our parents. He said that he owns a campsite a little ways down the path, and that he has his own little playground in the backyard of his camper. 
He then said that me and my friend were allowed to come over any time that we wanted and play at his campsite. My friend's mum was oblivious to the situation and told him that it was a very nice gesture and possibly that we could go later. My mum, on the other hand, who to say the very least has had experience with creeps, shut him down, told him no and to just go away. He walked away and my friend's mum started asking my mum why it was such a big deal. My mum told her that there's already a playground at that campground and that we are not allowed to go over there under any circumstances. She even went around to other campsites to warn people about this guy and to stay away from him. Weeks pass, the camping trip is over and everyone is home for the rest of summer. My mum is doing things around the house and she gets a phone call from her friend from the camping trip and she is freaking out, apologizing, telling her that she'll never go against her judgment ever again and to turn on the news. When my mum turns on the TV, there he is. Apparently, he had gone to a local pharmacy and tried to get some pictures developed, and the pharmacy found hundreds of pictures of underage girls and child porn, including his infant granddaughter. I had been sent to Korea from my university a few years ago. They told me that for my major I had to go somewhere in Asia and my friend had really talked up Korea for me. I knew nothing about it but I decided what the hell and I embarked on a semester long trip. I had only had one serious boyfriend in my life who I had broken up with a few months prior. I also don't enjoy one night stands and I wasn't digging the dudes at the clubs. But I still wanted to have some sort of romantic experience, I suppose, so my friend recommended that I use this dating app to meet English-speaking Koreans. That way, I could meet someone and experience the actual dating culture. And I thought that I was young and I should probably give it a go, so why not? I was just so eager to have new experiences, and maybe it sounds dumb, I know, to try dating in a foreign country, but it worked out for me eventually, but just not the first date. So I met him on a dating app after being in Seoul about three weeks. His name was Tim and I still didn't know the culture or the city very well and I was a bit naive about everything. He eagerly wanted to meet for a date after talking to me and honestly, he seemed nice. I should have asked more questions, I know, and I should have noticed that he was not giving me many details about himself. Tim was a guy a bit older than me, but he claimed that he was a college student. I assumed that he had done his military time, all men in Korea have to, and just returned to school. We talked for a bit and decided to meet for a tea date near the school that I went to. He wanted to come into my dorm originally to pick me up, but I live in an all-women's dorm and I didn't want him to know exactly where I lived since we were all strangers. So instead, I insisted that we meet at the main town center near the subway. He really didn't like this idea, which, looking back, was definitely a red flag. But eventually, I insisted. The night of the date, I waited an hour for this guy. He was very late. But Tim weirdly claimed that he just wanted to make me wait. I thought that he was kidding and messaged him a laughing emoji, assuming that he was just lost. When he finally arrived, he was much smaller than I thought. But a man's height has never been something that I cared about much. He was also quite thin. Maybe I let my guard down because I didn't see him as physically threatening to me. Which was a big mistake in the end. But right off the bat, he was way too touchy with me. And breathed creepily and heavily. His whole demeanor was just really off-putting to me. I'm usually very tolerant with different people types. But this was just very odd to me. I'd been told that Korean men would be polite and not so touchy on the first date. He was also dressed oddly like in business attire for a date, but I thought that maybe it was just a Korean thing. Again, I was dumb and I didn't know anything about the culture. Then, the first thing that he said to me was, You're not as white as I thought you were. I thought that this was a translation error, but his English was near perfect. So I asked for clarification. And he said what he meant. And he said, I thought that you would be more white. Your skin is darker than I thought. And your eyes aren't as green. Are you pure European? Now, I was officially weirded out. First of all, I'm pretty much as white as you can get. I'm Irish and Scandinavian, so white as hell basically. 
So the fact that he thought that I could have possibly been any whiter was kind of funny to me. Why did he care in the first place anyway? Why does my skin color matter to this guy and why is he bringing it up? He also said about three times on the date how he wished that I had greener eyes. And every time I would just reply, well maybe my online photos make me look brighter. And brushed it off as him being nervous and trying to start a conversation. Isn't it funny the dumb excuses you make for people when you're just panicked? Anyway, when we arrived at the tea place, I tried to order a basic raspberry tea, and he stopped me and told me that I had to have this special tea. I thought that it was weird that he wanted to choose the tea for me, but in my head I just brushed it off once again, and he really insisted that I drink only this type of tea, and I just agreed. These small details become even weirder later. So, after tea, he asked if we could look around my school for a bit. It was dark, but the school is very well lit, so I agreed. But the whole time we walked around, he would just randomly stop and grab me for long hugs. At first, I let it happen, but then I started to stop him. And he just kept trying. He kept grabbing me and breathing really hard into my neck. It was honestly just so awkward. He also would not tell me any personal details about himself, and I asked so many questions, desperately trying to distract him from all the awkward grabbing, and to try to get to know him a little better. But he would never tell me anything. He even said at one point, I'm a mysterious man, like a movie line or something. He also said something like, you look so much like my favorite movie character, and I asked who, but he said that I would have to figure it out on my own. Finally, he said, I want to go to a dark area, and in my head, I screamed, hell no, because at this point, I wanted this date over quickly. Strangely enough, too, he somehow knew where a wooded area behind my campus was, and he said that we should go there. I obviously said no, and that I wanted to stay near the main campus in town, but he just kept pushing. But finally, he grabbed my arm and started dragging me there. He said, I can't let anyone see, and I started to panic. I finally ripped my arm away and just demanded that we leave and go back to the main road immediately. Looking back, I don't know why I didn't ask for help or get angry. Maybe I was scared, but I just began to book it back to the main road, and he followed me. We ended up in front of a hospital near the center of town, and I told him that it was time for him to go. I made some excuse, and he was pleading with me to stay. I told him that we would meet the next day, I lied, and that I would message him. I just wanted to get away at this point, I was pretending that it was all okay just so that we could leave. Suddenly though, I think that he's leaning in to kiss me and I immediately think, oh hell no, but it was so much worse. Instead, I feel a pain in my face. It takes me a second to realize that he was biting my face. It was like a dog or something. I'd never felt the sensation before and he leaned his head sideways and bit me on my nose and cheek as hard as he could. I screamed and pushed him away from me. His face looked so freaky and I barely had time to react in words. Instead, I ran up to the sidewalk until I saw a convenience store on the right. I ran to the back of the store and bent down to just start crying. The man who owned the store started to yell at me but I couldn't explain my situation. I just begged him in English to let me stay and I ended up having to buy a popsicle to just stick around. And man, did I wish I had learned some Korean by then. I guess that Tim didn't follow me though because I peered outside the store and I didn't see him. I texted a friend and waited for them to get there to take me back to my dorm. On the way too, I messaged him and basically told him to just stay away from me. I told him that he was a creep and that he shouldn't bite women like that and something along the lines of me calling the police as well. And then I just blocked him. I was so scared to walk around my school after that too, and I was afraid that he would find me somehow. And I am so thankful that I never let him pick me up at my dorm. I called my mum to tell her what happened when suddenly she said, wait, what did he ask you? She then put some details together and realized that all of these weird things had to do with the Fifty Shades of Grey books. At first, I thought that she was just being silly and overthinking a bad date. I thought that she was joking, but in the end, she was right. 
She had recently seen the movie or read the book or something and knew the details. The eye colour, the way he dressed, the tea that he made me drink and the random lines that he said. It all matches the books and the movies for his dirty little fantasy. My mum thinks that he picks me because I looked like the girl in that movie to him. It explains why he was so fixated on my appearance too. And this whole thing with the biting and trying to dominate me was all from there as well. Even if it wasn't his intention, I later learned that there are a few creeps who seek out foreign girls to dominate them and have sex with them as like a prize or something. But they call it riding the white horse or something along those lines. On a happier note, this bad experience didn't stop me. I eventually met someone else in Korea and we actually ended up falling in love. We even did the whole long distance thing and now I'm living in Korea studying and working and even hoping to marry soon. So I guess you could say that I didn't let bad creepy guys stop my life. I don't tell this story often because, well, even in 2019 when it's less and less acceptable to victim blame, I still don't like having to answer questions like what time was it and what were you wearing. I went to college in a sleepy town near the US-Mexico border. And with 100,000 people, it's small enough to know many, but big enough that new faces don't really stand out. I frequented this walking trail that ran alongside a main road in town. The street is well driven, and the path is well used by runners, walkers, bikers, and people with strollers. Unless you're there near 11 at night, it's really quiet, like I was the last time I ever walked. I was about a half a mile from home, I had my headphones in and I was walking to clear my head from some particular stubborn anxiety, ironically fear that something bad was going to happen, when a car that I couldn't tell you what kind slows as it sees me. At the time I thought the car was a black Mustang, specifically the one a friend of mine drove. I approached the car thinking it was my friend, the smallish towns you know, as I get closer I see that it's not my friend. It's a man that I'd never seen before, in fact. Shaved head, glasses, yellow graphic tea of sorts. I distinctly remember thinking, too, that he actually looked a lot like my Uncle Dan. I stopped where I was, even took a step back. His lips were moving, but I couldn't make out what he was saying. Being the painfully polite person that I am, I take a step closer to hear him better, and I make out the word campus. Was he asking for directions to campus? He nodded affirmatively. Which campus? The community college or the university? He stumbled, clearly not having been prepared enough to know that he would be asked questions like this. He stammered out the name of the university in a way that made my head scream, he's not from here. Nonetheless though, I told him that he wasn't far, that he would need to turn around and go straight for another three to four miles. Another quiet utterance I couldn't make out. One more cautious step forward, and I say, what? My heart is pounding. I know this guy is a creep, but I don't know what kind of creep he is. I've been staring at his face this whole time, but it wasn't until that last step forward that I noticed the way that his hands were sitting, and what he was holding. He flashed a handgun. As soon as he saw me see it, he said it in a perfectly audible voice, get in the car. I completely froze. I didn't run. I didn't scream. Most assuredly, I didn't comply either. I just stopped functioning for whole seconds. Again, he said, get in the car. He was getting nervous too. His hand twitched on the gun. To this day, I can't explain why my brain chose to have me turn and just walk away from the car. Walk. But I heard the car start and somehow, I just knew that this was the end for me. He was turning around for me. I didn't want to watch. Nobody would even come for me if I screamed. So I just walked, resigned in that moment that I had given up. I can't tell you why, but it's just what happened. But instead of turning around, he just slammed on the gas and fled, leaving me shaking in a profoundly vulnerable mess. Enough we'd returned after a minute or so for me to call 911. A couple of cop cars showed up shortly after and they took my statement. I remember thinking the cops didn't believe me. One said I was pretty calm for somebody who was almost abducted. I was even feebly making jokes. 
For months after that, I scoured the internet too, looking for news stories about missing women or attempted abductions, hoping that I would find a mugshot with his face on it, but I never found one. Which means that there's a chance that he's still out there, going to college towns that he has no business in, asking for directions, looking like people's uncles, and then trying to abduct them. I've experienced night terrors for the better part of 20 years now. These days, it's kind of old hat. I know that it's imperative to not be afraid, so I simply just pray during these occurrences. In all my countless encounters in the dreamscape, I've only seen what's known as shadow people, that oppressive force that tries to suffocate, even at times, molest. Twice, I've heard the strangest, darkest voice. But otherwise, I have not seen any of the other archetypes common to night terrors. Months ago, my 25-year-old nephew texted me in a panic at around 4am. He lives far away on the east coast and he said that he just saw the old hag while staying at his girlfriend's house. This hag appeared in the threshold of the bedroom door, made her way toward him and finally began to smother him. He said that she began clawing and ripping at his right leg while he tried to fight her off. When he finally woke up, he packed his few belongings and rushed back to his place, overwhelmed by the fear and anxiety of the whole experience. We spoke that morning, and I did my best to make light of it, given my experiences, and calmed him down. Well, we ended up laughing about the whole thing, blaming it on the burrito that he had before falling asleep. Some months later, I began to have more frequent night terrors again. I can't quite figure out why there was a sudden uptick. Perhaps it was just the stress. I don't know, but... Early one morning, I woke up to find a large, heavy woman standing at the foot of my bed. She was sopping wet as though she was drowned. I tried to move, but of course, I couldn't. Sleep paralysis had me in its insufferable grip at this point, so I began to pray as she approached my side of the bed. A struggle ensued, and she began ripping and clawing at my left arm. My arm throbbed from the phantom attack, or so it seemed. I finally struggled awake, relieved, and I even laughed a little. That was a new one, I thought. I immediately called my nephew to tell him that I had finally seen what I thought was the old hag, too. I explained in detail what had happened. But here's the strangest part of the whole ordeal. When I mentioned that she had clawed his leg but had clawed my arm, he immediately corrected me and said, No, no, that's wrong. The old hag clawed at my left arm also. And I really can't quite make heads or tails of that one. A few years back, my older sister and I decided that we wanted to go for a walk in a nearby park. It was early summer and we had decided that we wanted to get healthy and eat better and whatnot. It never did happen, but it's a thought that counts, right? So we decided that walking would be a good way to introduce any sort of exercise into our lives. A little background info on this park too and the surrounding area. So we lived in a town where almost everything was named after Native American or First Nation tribes and names. Our local school district was a Native American name, our roads and, you guessed it, our parks too. This park in particular seemed to have many rumours that it was an old burial ground, but I think that that was bullcrap and just something that dumb white kids like to tell each other during sleepovers. Anyway... The park is made up of cleared hills with a small paved path kind of meandering through it. If you follow the path all the way back, you have the option to stay on the pavement and return to the beginning, or go off onto a separate unpaved path with a small forest. We, having felt like we hadn't burned enough calories yet, decided to keep walking deeper into the forest. After walking for about five minutes, I'd say, we came to a small clearing that had six distinct paths branching off. The clearing had a sign claiming that all the paths looped back around and a few facts about the park. We decided to go through one and that we'd see how we felt once we got back to the clearing. When we had gotten back, we decided that we were probably sweaty enough and that we should just return back home to make lunch. We had gone back down the path that we were sure leads to the front of the park, all the while talking about stupid stuff that the two of us had gotten up to in the past few days. After walking a little bit, we joked that it always feels longer after you decide that you want to go home. And then, seemingly almost like magic, the path that we went down had led us back to the clearing. 
We looked at each other, both saying that it was a bit weird, and then just kind of laughed it off as us not being the most trustworthy at directions. We decided to make sure this time that the path that we went down was the same path the sign was facing, seeing as it greeted us when we first got to the clearing. I was sure that we had done that the first time around, but wasn't 100%. However, when we did that, it had led us back around again to the same clearing. We decided to go down a different path at this stage, the one directly to the right of the path that we had taken before. Maybe we just didn't realize that the sign wasn't directly in front of the right path. We were led straight back to the clearing again. It was at this point that we decided to make a system and to always go right off the path that we had taken before so that we didn't lose track. I remember us making jokes about how it would be the two of us to die in the woods that is only a mile away from civilization, or how the Blair Witch was probably mad at us and that if we saw a pile of rocks, not to mess with them. We were very light-hearted through this entire thing, but in the back of my mind, something just wasn't right. The more and more that we walked too, the more it felt like someone was watching us. I couldn't express it to my sister for fear of her making fun of me, or worse, saying that she felt the same way. And it wasn't the type of watching as though we were being hunted or stalked. It was like whatever was watching us was finding humor in our being lost. It wasn't outright threatening, but it definitely was a very uneasy feeling. And when we made it to the sixth and final path, we laughed at our luck at it being the last path to choose. We talked about maybe going swimming later on. We were both now quite sweaty. However, when the path ended, it didn't take us out to the front of the park. It was the same exact clearing that we'd been stuck in for the past few hours now. I didn't know what to think at this point. Maybe our system was flawed and we had to think of a new way to make sure that we weren't taking the same paths over and over. As we both stood there in silence, partially from being dumbfounded and partially from being out of breath, I swear to you that I heard something chuckle behind us in the trees. It could have been my imagination, I admit, or it could have even been an animal, but all I remember is saying, right, screw this, and making a beeline into the woods. My sister started following me and asked me what I was doing. I explained that if we just walked straight and didn't turn at all the paths like we did before, that we would make it out somehow. She agreed and didn't seem to object at trampling through the high grass and the thorns and trees, which made me feel like she had felt strange about the situation too. When we finally saw a break in the trees, we both sighed in relief. We walked straight out of the woods and into the backyard of somebody else's house in a nearby housing development. We walked around the front and saw an older lady sitting on her front porch, drinking some lemonade or something. She asked us where we had come from, and we just said that we got lost in the woods, and asked where exactly we were. She didn't seem shocked in the slightest, too, and she said, Ah, yeah, those woods will do that to you. She offered us some lemonade and a ride back to our car. We took the lemonade, but decided to walk back to the car, and... We were a long bit away at this point, but we decided that we'd be fine as long as we stuck to the roads. I remember telling my mum about it right after it happened, and she said that we weren't the outdoorsy type, so no one really believes me when I say how creeped out I was, and how that feeling disappeared too as soon as we left those woods. All I know is that whatever was in those woods wasn't happy that my sister and I were there, and I won't be going back to see if it ever happens again. These events took place in the spring of 2014. My friend Sarah and Trisha had finally agreed to come camping with me. The problem was is that none of us were experienced in surviving in the wilderness, but that didn't stop us. We packed our gear, loaded up on food, alcohol, and made our way to our location. When we arrived at the spot Sarah had googled, we realized that we would have to hike for a while in order to find a spot suitable to actually set up camp. We hiked for some time before reaching a clearing. We set up camp, started a fire, and opened a bottle of tequila. After some drinking and a few blunts passed between us, I decided it was time to start preparing for dinner, so I left Sarah and Trisha by the fire as I was separating our dinner. As I was busy preparing food, I realized that a man was approaching our camp. Hey there, he said with a thick Irish accent. I was caught off guard as 
I wasn't really expecting to see anyone, but nonetheless, he did seem friendly, so I replied. Oh, uh, hi. I didn't even notice you there. Been hiking for a while? Yeah, uh, for a bit. What are you cooking there? He said, gesturing to me. I invited him to join us because, well, I'm not rude, and like I said, he honestly seemed like a nice guy. So we walk over to the fire where I introduce him to Sarah and Trisha, who seemed extremely unimpressed about our new guest. After eating dinner, we kept drinking, but during this time it was becoming very clear that our guest had really taken a liking to me. He kept trying to move closer to me and was paying little to no attention to my friends. He was only speaking and focusing on me while drinking his bottle of whiskey. That's when things took a turn and his conversation started to become more sexual. This obviously made everyone pretty uncomfortable, but it wasn't until he leant over, grabbed the back of my neck and said, Come on baby, get rid of these two bitches and come bed with me. That things really took a turn for the worse. Before I could even react, Trisha was already right behind him trying her best to get him away from me while screaming like a banshee. I can't remember what she was saying, but she was inventing her own swear words amongst threats and insults. It worked too, and he let go of my neck, took a step back, looked at Trisha, and let out the most sinister smile that I'd ever seen. It was honestly something that I cannot describe, except for that he had beautiful teeth and a smile, but something about it, combined with the look in his eyes, just gave me goosebumps. He slowly starts walking away from our camp while laughing. I was absolutely petrified, but decided to quickly tidy up before hiding in my tent. I was originally meant to sleep in my own tent while the other two girls shared, but after what happened just then, we all huddled into my tent together. Everything had been quiet for a while, with the exception of Trisha's snoring, and I was about to fall asleep when I heard twigs crunching and the sound of footsteps fast approaching us. I laid still, holding my breath, completely immobilized by fear until I heard my tent being opened, and Sarah then letting out a scream so loud that he even jolted back the Irish psycho a few steps. Trisha has been woken by this stage, and we're all standing outside the tent. Sarah and Trisha are yelling, and I'm fumbling with my phone trying to call the police when he hits Trisha in the face. I dropped everything, and I yelled, Leave! Run now! Man held Trisha's arm and didn't look back. It's important to know too that we only had socks on at this point, and running through the woods at night with only socks is pretty difficult. Plus, with a psycho possibly chasing us, it was terrifying. I ran until I tripped over a log and smashed my chin down on the ground pretty hard, and that's where the three of us stayed hidden low to the ground for a few hours, but it was pitch black, so we couldn't see a thing. Eventually, when we felt safe enough, we walked back to camp to find everything absolutely destroyed. Both Sarah and Trish had their weed and alcohol stolen too, but my whole backpack was gone and my phone was smashed to pieces and I thank my lucky stars that I had no documents in there that could fully identify me, but he definitely knew which one belonged to me and took it. We didn't want to waste any more time though and we ran back to the car as fast as we could, occasionally injuring ourselves on the way as we could barely see anything ahead. We get to the car and I'm trying to start the engine, which is making sounds like it's about to completely die. When we see him come out from the brush and starts heading towards the car, laughing. We're all hysterically screaming, but through it all I hear him say something about doing something to my car so it won't be able to start. In my frenzy, I don't know what I did, but... I managed to actually start the engine and floor the accelerator so hard that my car did a mini jump and took off down the road, leaving him behind in the dust. I drove like an absolute maniac until we reached the next town, only to discover too that my car had been leaking oil the whole way back as well, besides whatever other damage had been done by that psycho. We were eventually picked up by Trisha's dad who took us to the police station to file a police report and then to the hospital to get her jaw x-rayed. Unfortunately as well, it was broken in two places. And they never did catch it. This happened around the time that I was eight or nine, sleeping over at a friend's place. Her house was a two-story with my large game room right at the top of the stairs. We were sleeping on a long couch at the time, and our heads were on either side, so... If I extended my leg, I'd touch her feet. 
So it was around 3 or 4 a.m. when I woke up to her getting off the couch. She's about halfway down the stairs when I walk to the top of the stairs and ask her what she's up to. She says, I'm just going to get her some snacks. Not totally unusual, as we like to get up to watch scary stuff and eat food when her mum went to bed. I turn on the TV and walk downstairs to the kitchen to help, but when I get there, she's just not there. I call her name and check to see if she's in the bathroom, but she's not there either. I thought that maybe she went back upstairs and I just didn't hear her footsteps. I decided to lay back down on the couch and wait for her as I didn't see her on the couch, downstairs or upstairs. So I lay down on the couch waiting and I roll over to my side and my foot presses something warm and I extend my leg to see what it is and it's her foot. I sit up confused as to when she had gotten there and she was dead asleep. I asked her about it in the morning and she ever so nonchalantly just says, Oh yeah, I don't know who she is but she looks like me. And after that, I never slept over again. When I was in my freshman year of college, I went to a small liberal arts college in the Midwest. I wasn't having the best time and missed my high school friends a lot. So, two of my friends, we'll call them C&L, drove up from our hometown so that we could road trip to go see our other friend, who we'll call W, that lived about two hours away. W went to a pretty large state school known for being one of the top party schools in the country. So, when we got to a dorm, we unsurprisingly started the night off with some drinks. We played drinking games in W's dorm for a while until we started to get tipsy and bored. They had recently changed the local law and minors were no longer allowed in bars past 10pm. We were 19 and 20 years old and too afraid to sneak into the bars but didn't feel like staying in anyway. So we decided that it would be best to look for a house party instead. We found several and ended up moving from house to house, getting progressively drunker throughout the night. L finally succumbed to the sheer amount of alcohol and had to head home. L didn't live on campus, so W left to go with her and head back to the dorms. C and I decided to stay at the house party for a little while longer, even though we knew the two mile walk back to the dorms would be pretty brutal. But we finally got tired around 3am and we decided to head back to my friend's dorm. Now, the wind outside was freezing and blowing hard. Crappy Midwest winters, but thankfully we had brought our coats with us that night. C and I started walking since the bus was out of service for the night and there were no cabs around. Really, there were basically no people or cars or really anything or anyone on the street. But this was actually kind of surprising too because of just how much of a party town this was, even though it was winter. So, C and I walked for a bit before stopping in front of a couple of bars where there was a bench to smoke, when we noticed two guys still hanging around. The bars here close at 2am. Now, that wasn't too surprising. As I said, it's a college town, so you can usually expect to see a few drunk college kids at least roaming around in the early hours of the morning. But they noticed us as soon as we sat down and walked over to us and started chatting. I don't remember their names now, but they talked with us about how they were new on campus and that they were foreign exchange students. I honestly can't for the life of me remember where they said that they were from too. They also mentioned that they were waiting for a ride to go home as they lived in the next town over. They seemed nice enough so we kept talking to them for a while, even though it was freezing and they were just wearing t-shirts. Finally their ride shows up and they ask us to come with them, but we declined because we had to get back to our friends. And they kept pushing, telling us that they'd bring us back early in the morning and it wasn't that big of a deal. Again though, we declined. And after about 10 minutes, they gave up on trying to get us to come with them and asked for hugs before they left. It was a little weird, I admit, but C and I were 19 and 20 year olds with zero common sense. And they seemed like nice enough guys, so we agreed. And as soon as these guys went in for hugs, they gripped us as tight as they could, picked us both up from the ground, and proceeded to try and put us in their friend's vehicle. Panicked, we kicked them as hard as we could and we screamed. This must have scared them a bit too because I don't think they were expecting us to fight back and the two men just put us down, jumped in their friend's car and sped off, leaving us in shock on the sidewalk. But my friend and I just looked at each other and took off running to our friend's place. 
We made it back without incident, but we didn't tell anyone about it except for L and W. C, L and I left the next day and haven't really been back since then too. C and I sort of laugh about it now and reminisce about it as just another crazy thing that's happened to us over the course of our friendship. I have no idea what could have happened to us if they were able to get us in their car. But to be honest, I don't really want to find out. My grandma on my mum's side was just a truly evil person. I mean, she told her oldest son, my Uncle Sam, that it was his job to de-virginize his sisters, no matter how much they told him no. Thankfully for my mum, my Aunt Rachel protected her from him, and because of that and other reasons, not limited to drugs and pedophilia, we didn't associate with that side of the family other than my Aunt Rachel. Now, when I was maybe 13, my grandma was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. My grandpa begged my mum and Aunt Rachel to visit to make their peace with her. They agreed under the stipulation that nobody else from the family would be allowed to be there. A couple of days before my grandma died, she was telling my other aunt, Stephanie, that there was something in the fireplace that had been watching over her her whole life and was there to take her away. She then started hissing at my aunt... My aunt, obviously terrified for her life, picked up the phone and just dialed a random number. That number somehow ended up being my Aunt Rachel. Once Rachel was able to get Stephanie to calm down and tell her what was happening, she immediately packed a bag and drove down to my grandparents' house. Now, keep in mind, my aunt hadn't talked in about 13 years at this point. There was no way that she could have had her number since she had moved a couple of times since they last spoke to each other. The only way my grandpa was even able to get hold of her, or my mum, was by finding the phone number for our family business. When my Aunt Rachel made it down to my grandparents' house, my grandpa and Stephanie's kids, my cousins, were there watching over my grandma as well. Aunt Rachel, being super religious, took control and told everyone what to do and was about to lead an exorcism herself. From what my cousin told me at my grandma's funeral, my aunt made everyone stand around my grandma and pray. She also warned them not to open their eyes during the whole ordeal. She then told my grandpa that he had to tell whatever was with my grandma to get out of his house. My cousin actually told me that he opened his eyes out of curiosity to see what was going on. And he saw something hovering over my grandma that he is convinced was an angel. When my grandpa told whatever it was to leave his house, light shot out all through the house and brightened the whole place up as well. And from the few times that I went to their house as a kid, I remember it always being just a really dark and cold place. After this, we stopped at the house to say final goodbyes and the house was just, well, bright and well lit, for lack of a better term. Other than the living room where the fireplace was though. My grandma had actually collected porcelain dolls and after the funeral, my grandpa gave each kid a doll as a keepsake. I'm 100% convinced that whatever was watching over my grandma hid itself in the doll that we received. Because everyone in our family constantly felt like the doll was watching us and we all had nightmares from it too. Thinking that we were just projecting our fears onto this doll, we gave it to some family friends without telling them why. And they gave it back a working week later because... They all had nightmares too. So in the end, we just sent it to my Aunt Rachel who put a crucifix on it and buried it with holy water. So I was listening to some videos on YouTube this morning and it made me recall two incidents that I've personally experienced dealing with sex traffickers. If memory serves, only one of my best girlfriends knows some of the information and one ex who was a cop. My mum broke the first incident down earlier to me this year, which I had no recollection of. This info is basically confirmed by her, and this is a long story, so I apologise for the length. This isn't completely for sharing a personal experience, but hopefully we'll get some people more conscious on their surroundings out in public. So, the first incident happened when we moved back to Ohio. Well, I was somewhere between 11 and 12 years old at the time. And boy, at this age, I was completely oblivious, despite my mum's attempts to educate me on signals of danger. I was rejected by the homeschool group at the time, so it isn't like I had a lot of friends to practice social skills with or anything. And my cousins were in the group too, and it just ignored me most of the time when we were out in public. 
To be fair though, we all get along now and have since senior year of high school. So, this year, Mum brought it up twice. Earlier, around February, and again around April. Both bringing the story back into my head and realising what I had avoided. I kid you not too, but I'm surprised what I actually construed in my head as a kid. You know how in the movies that there's always that trigger that dramatically recalls a good or bad memory? Well, yeah, I literally flashed back into the day that this happened years ago. My family went to a major hub, and I won't say exactly where because it's close to where I still live, and we were shopping. Dad used to make a living as he was paid to fly around the country to fix technologies in hospitals and whatnot, and train people on how to optimize systems. We didn't typically do this at the major hub, but it was a treat as my sister and I's birthday was coming up, so it was a nice time. And this hub had everything. IMAX theater, an Apple store, an American Girl store, you name it, it was probably there. But this all went down in a large bath and body building of the main strip. My younger sister was tired, so dad opted to keep her in the Jeep Commander and stayed with her. Mum and I went inside for the bath and body sales going on. Both are important. I was in the bath and body with just mum. My sister never made it inside, as explained earlier, so mum and I were just looking around together. Somehow, I wound up walking away from my mum to look over the merchandise. My mum didn't notice too until she heard the front door open as it made some sort of noise and this medium-sized guy walks in. In her eyes, she explained, she saw this cliché all-white van pull up in front of the entrance and she thought that I was still next to her and broke from a trance when the door opened. The way this guy walked and was dressed, it made the entire store just kind of stand in silent horror and stare at him. Every adult in that store knew that something was about to happen but didn't know what. The white van had a driver who stayed put and that was when mum was absolutely horrified and realised that I was no longer next to her but across the store. The guy hadn't noticed me alone yet since I was just out of view. She called my dad and said something about what was about to happen, but didn't realize that he was going to approach me until he did. As mum was on the phone, she told dad not to let the van leave at any cost if something did happen. But my sister was asleep in the back and dad calmly pulled the Jeep Commander, a hefty vehicle, to a position where he could actually ram the van if needed to. He's a retired Air Force veteran, so he could calculate the best angle to hit it to break the van. But he also had a very injured back, so even just sweeping with a broom briefly can put him out for a good few weeks. And the fact that he was preparing to ram another vehicle to this day makes me extremely grateful and sad at the pain that he could have experienced. As this was going on though, the guy approached me and started casually talking. The other adults were not nearby, and I was by the exit. The mum was too terrified to move as he reached for my wrist to spray it. And when I gave him my wrist to spray the perfume that he wanted input for his girlfriend on, it was the way that he grabbed my wrist that broke my mum's trance and made a scene. The guy released my wrist, thankfully, and just bolted for the door, jumped in the van, and ran. At the time, mum did suspect kidnapping, but didn't realise that it was actually a sex trafficker. Jumping back into the night, mum was telling me this as a 24-year-old woman. She was freaked out and I didn't remember this guy actually had my wrist. She grabbed my wrist and jerked it up a certain way this guy did. And oh my gosh, the trigger actually worked. And it freaked me out as I remembered those details. I was horrified at myself for not remembering this too. But now to the second story. So I went to a gas station five minutes away from my house it was around 4 or 5 in the afternoon. I wanted a Pepsi since I'd spent the day running for paint and painting walls in my room. It was 90 degrees outside, so it seemed like a good enough plan at the time. I got there and I got my Pepsi and a couple of other things for my mum too and I walked out the door. Now, my car was literally parked right in front of the door and as I was checking out, a yellow New York license plate on a blue Jeep Wrangler pulled up next to the left side of my car. I paid and walked out to my door but had to stand there awkwardly for a moment. There was this very short woman, probably uh, 5 feet 5'2 I'd say, long black hair sported back into a ponytail and 
She wore a plain tank with some basic athletic running leggings and very well kept for brand new sneakers. She was standing all but next to my car door with this guy who was at least 5'5", wearing nicer clothes. He was whispering so quietly as he towered over this woman, giving her cash and sent her inside for something. He walked past me before I got in my car and left. He positioned himself next to his car door to monitor the woman closely from outside. I was only a minute down the road when the scene played back into my head. I had just watched some of Priceless the day before, made by For King and Country. It's for the women who survive trafficking, a really powerful movie that should be seen at least once. And I had already seen three flags as I pulled out from that interaction. I was driving the direction to my home as I called my mum, explaining what happened. My mum was disturbed. I was definitely unsettled. Mum was surprised too, since I don't get this way. I told mum that I was turning around and I hung up the phone, saying that I'd call her once I captured the license plate information. When I got there, the woman was still inside, but I don't know exactly where just offhand. I told the cashier to keep an eye on both of them as something was definitely wrong. She kind of just brushed me off, but I did see her watching the guy at least once. As I pulled in too, I rattled the plates to my video camera so he couldn't see my phone. I walked in and began pretending that mum wanted meat for the grill as I analyzed the situation. The guy eventually realized that I was casing him and he started to stare at me. Eventually, a black car pulled in with an older couple. The second the woman went outside with her groceries, he, she, and the couple awkwardly interacted. She also made no eye contact whatsoever with anybody since they pulled in, especially this couple. She was absolutely silent and timid. The well-dressed man came inside and began to case me as well. She stood between the old couple, who positioned themselves uniquely by her. I'm still on the phone with my mum, trying to convince her to let me off to call 911 since he was casing. She said that she would come personally if we disconnected, and she had my younger sisters there too. Given their background though, I really didn't want them near this potential hostility if all hell broke loose. The guy kept making his way towards me inconspicuously at what was blindside angles. I positioned myself to keep him in view at all times as he coldly stared at me as if he was saying, I know you know. If I'm being honest too, I was absolutely terrified. I mean, this dude was creepy as hell. But then, a godsend happened. A high school friend just so happened to walk in. He never drinks soda and was dying for a soda that day apparently. Mum let me hang up as soon as I saw him. And as soon as we saw each other, I quickly initiated conversation. And as soon as this happened, the guy quickly went outside and all four stood by my car for at least 10 minutes. I talked to this guy the entire time who I didn't tell what happened. I didn't want to give him the situation. I didn't want to give the situation away. I couldn't dial 911 because if I paid more attention to my screen, it would have scared him off, I think. And to be honest, I wasn't even sure if I was okay to dial 911. I mean, I did see flags, but wasn't pinning them as trafficking signals or anything. Just that something seemed wrong. But they eventually got in their cars and they left and... I got home and dialed the highway patrol and let them know what happened and gave them all the details that I had. It took me about another two to three days to register what exactly went down that night. I couldn't go back to the gas station for several months. I only started going back when they got new management. And we later found out from the cops that that gas station is indeed where traffickers hand off their victims. And to this day... I refuse to go there in the evenings or at night. I also sure do hope that they can find that girl. So I've had my fair share of paranormal experiences in life, but this one sticks out to me as one of the most memorable. But this happened around six years ago, I think. At the time, I lived with my parents and my two brothers in our two-story house. My bedroom is located on the second floor, right next to my parents, with my brothers being in the cellar. That night, I wake up thirsty and decide to get something to drink. Already kind of unusual since I'm a very deep sleeper and rarely ever wake up at night. In order to get a drink from downstairs, I also have to cross the hallway with my parents' bedroom on the left. So I'm sleepily shuffling my way past that room when I hear it, the loud snoring of my dad. 
The door is wide open, as always, but the room is too dark to actually make out anything, besides the outlines of the bed. But I certainly feel the presence of someone in there. My dad is actually known for his irritating snoring, so I don't really think anything of it. In fact, it's kind of comforting, actually. So I get my drink and I head back to bed. The next morning, I greet my mum at the breakfast table and I look around. Hey, where's dad? I ask. She looks at me. What do you mean, sweetheart? He's not home yet. He had to work a night shift. Turns out that my mum and I were the only ones in the house. My brothers were staying at a friend's and my mum had slept on the couch in the living room. And if I had known that beforehand, I would have freaked the hell out at the incident, so I'm kind of glad that I didn't. It couldn't have been a dream too, since the water bottle that I got was still present at my nightstand. Although, I'll freely admit that it could have been an auditory hallucination, I know that. But still, very weird and something that I'll never forget. So, I've heard similar stories on here and was hoping that someone could explain these two events. Something just seemed to be in my home, walking about, taking the form of me and my brother Sam. I'm 22 and female. So years ago, I was around 10 at the time, I was sleeping in my bed when my brother Sam shouted for me. When I sleepily made my way to the other room where he was using the computer... He asked me why I kept creeping in and out of the room behind him and ignoring him when he asked me what I was doing. The computer is by the window so you can clearly see the reflection of the room at night time. And Sam said that he could see me in the reflection messing about behind him. I insisted that I hadn't been up for a few hours and that he was just trying to scare me but Sam insisted that he saw me. I also had another thing happen a couple of months apart from this story as well. So Sam and I shared a room whilst my bedroom was being redecorated. I was on the high bunk bed, Sam slept below and I was a light sleeper. I saw the bedroom door open and I saw him leaving. I asked if he could bring me a glass of water as I had a dry throat. He paused, said nothing and continued to leave. He never did come back in and when the morning came I was going to ask him about it but he just wasn't in his bed. In fact I couldn't find him in the entire house so... I asked my parents where he'd gone and it turned out that he was having a sleepover at a friend's house and wasn't at home that night. It only then dawned on me and I remembered that he left around yesterday dinner time to his friend's house. I told my parents that someone opened my bedroom door and stood there but they just said that I was seeing things. At the time I saw the figure, I was very tired but it was very late at night and I'd clearly forgotten that Sam wasn't home, so I didn't think anything of it at the time. But boy, does it creep me out to this day. So, some quick background information for those of you who may not know about Army Basic Training. So I shipped out to Fort Jackson on February 12th, 2019 as a National Guardsman. A main part of basic training pertaining to general operations in the barracks is fire guard. A fire guard is basically at the minimum. Two soldiers will put on a prescribed uniform. Almost always OCPs, which is just the basic army uniform that you see. Well, one will man a desk at one of the barracks is opposite the bathrooms, and the other will roam the barracks making sure everything is up to standard. Fire guard takes place between 9pm to whenever wake up is. Usually fire guard is about uh, one or two hour shifts. If your platoon is messing up and angering the drill sergeants, sometimes they'll raise the amount of soldiers on fire guard. My platoon messed up and got up to eight on fire guard, in full battle rattle, which means our combat helmets and tactical vests. Anyway, so I was on fire guard along with seven other soldiers. Two were on the desk at the end of the barracks and four of us were standing by the bathrooms. The remaining two were sleeping in the bathrooms and... Well, me and my four fellow soldiers are conversing, just shooting the breeze basically, near the bathrooms, just trying to pass the time away. When we all hear, don't go to sleep, whispered hoarsely, as if someone was trying to be quiet but also trying to yell. But we froze and we heard it again, don't go to sleep. I looked around at the four of us standing and ran into the bathroom and I saw the only two people in there were dead asleep. 
slumped on the bench in the showers. I whispered to them, Yo, are you guys messing with us? To which they sleepily awoke, stared at me with confusion on their faces, barely able to muster a croaky, what? I could tell that they were dead asleep as well, and that was when I heard it again, coming from the pitch black shower room. I looked at them, they looked at me, and before we could speak, we just dead sprinted out of the bathrooms, and as we passed the other three soldiers standing outside of the bathrooms, they joined us in a full-on sprint to the other side of the barracks, towards the desk. We informed the two at the desk what had happened, and as we were explaining it, we saw a shadowy figure, damn near clear as day, walk from one bathroom to the other. But there are two bathrooms facing each other at that side of the barracks. And safe to say, none of us got any sleep that night. When I was around 12 years old, I was visiting my cousins, 8, 11, and 13, and spending a few nights there. They also had a dog, which comes into the story later. So, they had all these really cool toys, and a whole line of spy toys, for my lack of a better word. But they weren't super high quality, but included things like directional microphones, night vision goggles, and a set of three motion detectors with a central unit that would beep and light up whenever motion was detected. So at some point, my cousin's parents told us that they were going out for dinner and that the oldest was in charge. Well, we got to playing this game where we would try and sneak around the house and we set up motion detectors near the front door, basement door and the top of the stairs to the second floor and we had a blast. We were winding down and went into the basement to hang out and watch a movie until my aunt and uncle came home from dinner when we heard it. Three distinct beeps. We all gave each other a strange look. We must have left the unit on, but... What triggered it? They weren't supposed to be home for like another hour. After some debate, we decided that it must have been the dog and we just continued watching the movie. But then we hear it again, this time from the basement door detector, three beeps. We all looked at each other again and then we saw the dog walk out of the laundry room. And at this point, we start freaking out because it definitely wasn't the dog this time. And then we heard the basement door open. Luckily, they had a wireless phone in the house that we were carrying around in case we needed to get in touch with aunt and uncle. I shouted at my cousin, call 911, very much wanting whoever this intruder was to hear that the police were on their way. My two younger cousins started crying in panic and my older cousin was on the phone explaining that there was an intruder. The operator asked if the front door was locked and then told him, to my shock, that we would need to let the police in since the door was locked. He handed the phone off to my younger cousin to stay on the line until the police arrived. And he grabbed two of our toy cap guns, long rifles, and handed one to me. The police were there really quick and we bolted upstairs to the front door with our weapons in hand. We must have looked very comical, but we opened the door, which was actually unlocked. For the police, and everything calmed down real quickly as they walked through the house with us and inspected everything. In the end, they decided that there were no signs of break-in and that our toys were just cheap and malfunctioning. But it would have been very easy for the intruder to escape from the back door before the police arrived. I still think that the police were just trying to ease our tensions and they probably knew that a person wouldn't attempt a second break-in knowing that someone was home. Later that night, we told my aunt and uncle what had happened and they were upset with us but happy we were all safe for calling the police because we were home alone. I didn't understand that, and apparently they could get in trouble for leaving us at home. Nothing was stolen, so they thought that we were just making it up, but later, my oldest cousin told me that there had been several break-ins in the neighborhood recently. And upon triple checking, those toys were definitely not malfunctioning. Oh, and also, the basement door was open. So this story takes place in the early 1930s. He, my great-grandfather, was living in India, which was still under British rule at the time. As he was from a poor family, having a motor vehicle was not even an option for him. It was just for the rich people back then. So he used to travel to nearby places on horses. Now one day, he went to meet his friend, and it got a little bit late by the time that he was coming back. 
It was around evening when, while returning, he decided to take a short route through the jungle instead of going through the road, which takes almost double the time. And on the way, he saw a little goat just abandoned sitting beside a tree, and thought that it might have lost its way and decided to bring it along and leave it just outside of the jungle. He got off and picked it up and put it on the back of the horse, and just when he was about to sit down, he noticed something weird. The horns and the feet of the goat were facing the opposite direction. But quickly, under fear, he pushed the goat down and climbed up to the horse to make a run out of the jungle. He started chanting a prayer to his guru. He was a Sikh in religion. And just as the horse started moving, he heard a female voice from behind him. And she said, Your prayer saved you today, but I don't know how you'll get away next time. And as he turned back, he saw a woman standing there instead of a goat, just staring at him with eyes wide open. And this story, allegedly according to my great-grandfather, is true, and it honestly creeps me out. A few years ago, during what was probably the darkest period in my life, I worked overnights at a local Walmart six days a week, I would spend 9pm to 7am stocking anything from fishing lures to makeup. I've never been in a more depressing environment if I'm being honest. Everyone was really apathetic and too caught up in their own depressing lives to care about anything or anyone else. But this included the managers as well. But Walmarts have a generally weird vibe to them anyway, but this was a 24-hour supercenter in rural West Virginia, so you can imagine the characters meth and opioid addicts mostly that would show up throughout the night. We had no security guards and from what I've come to understand a lot of the cameras especially in the parking lot haven't worked properly in quite a while. Being one of the few young female overnight stockers I encountered my fair share of unwanted advances too but the one who took the cake was the guy who would show up every time I went outside for a smoke break regardless of the time. 2am, 4am, 6am, it didn't matter. The dude would just appear around the corner and try to strike up a conversation within seconds of me stepping outside. It also didn't matter what entrance I used and there were three. At first I assumed that he must have worked there. I mean, why else would anyone voluntarily lurk around a shifty Walmart all hours of the night? Pretty much everyone on that shift smoked during the two nightly 15 minute breaks so it wasn't out of the question to think that he was doing the same. Maybe the timing was just a coincidence, but no, I came to find out that he didn't actually work there, even though he often wore a dark blue t-shirt, just like an overnight employee. I stopped going outside alone once I found that out, and would only venture outside with one of my guy friends, particularly one that I've been friends with since middle school, but even their presence didn't deter him, and it kind of became a, a store-wide joke in the end. I was weirded out, but not alarmed, until he started getting a little more aggressive. He'd ask me if I was seeing anyone and would ask me out, pretty much every chance that he got. I was playing GTA 5 at the time, so I came up with a story about my scary long-distance boyfriend Trevor from Northern California. Yes, I actually said that, and even then he wasn't phased. I was done feigning politeness though, and in the end I just began ignoring him. One night, when my main guy friend called in sick and the others were working on something on the opposite side of the store, I went outside with two older women in my area. After a few minutes, they went inside and just as I was about to follow them, Walmart Creeper suddenly appeared. I'm pretty sure he'd been waiting around the corner the whole time too and insisted on me going to his car with him to see something, taking my hand in his. Not hard, but I was still pretty pissed that he touched me. I'm a generally angry person anyway, so I basically just lost my head and ripped my hand away and sprinted inside. I reported him to the head manager that night and found out that he had a cousin who worked in the back unloading trucks. Apparently, he liked to hang out with his cousin at work. The cousin apologized profusely and said that he talked to him, but the management was a whole other level of crappy and didn't even say anything to the creeper, let alone ban him from the premises. In fact, I ended up quitting specifically because of the horrible management, although it was over an entirely different situation. I found out through a friend though that the guy, who was still hanging out of the store every night and was still doing his creepy thing with other women, 
tried like hell to learn my name and even where I lived. He was apparently asking around for me for weeks after I left, before disappearing himself. I can't help but keep thinking about how those parking lot cameras, they haven't worked in such a long time. And if anyone would have even cared to even notice if I just disappeared on one of those long and tiring work nights. I was staying at my mum's house while she and my stepdad were on vacation in the Smokies. They went there twice a year in the spring and the fall and I took care of her pets and the place while they were gone. I asked a friend of mine if he wanted to stay one night to have a paranormal experience. I had been telling him stories about that place for years and he didn't seem to believe, but he was interested in experiencing something like that himself, so this was the perfect time to do it. He showed up in the evening with his girlfriend. I wasn't expecting his girlfriend to be with him, so I explained what they were there for and asked if she was okay with what could happen. She said that if it got scary that she'd just leave, so we went in. I took them up to the attic in my older brother's room first. We went all the way inside and I started telling stories about the poltergeist activity that we had in that house since we moved in, including stories about the barn. I figured that that might get them prepared for when it got dark. The attic that we were standing in was the most active place in the house. I definitely wouldn't have gone in there alone. The little door to the attic moved and shook all night long, every night too since we moved in as well as scratching and thumping coming from inside of there most nights as well. Some of it could be debunked as wind or mice or someone just walking downstairs, but most of the time there just wasn't an explanation. Upstairs in that house was the perfect place for him to have a paranormal experience since the attic was so active. The barn is active too, but a little more dangerous to have an experience in. Plus, you have to be alone in the barn for anything to happen. But the house for some reason just didn't care how many people were in there. So, while I was telling these stories, I noticed a stack of encyclopedias that was in disarray. I picked one up that was on the floor next to the stack and put it on the top of the stack. Then, I straightened out the stack so that it was all neat. I'm a little OCD about that stuff. And then, we went out of the barn and I showed them some things and told a couple more stories. It was starting to get dark at this point, so we went upstairs into the house and sat around talking for a while. And before you know it, the attic door starts rattling. Both of their jaws just dropped. I had a feeling that he didn't believe the stuff I was telling him. There was no one else in the house and it was dead calm outside, so there was no debunking this. His girlfriend immediately wanted to leave. He somehow talked her into staying, even though the attic door was rattling the whole time. I told them though that the door rattled every night. It was harmless and we just got used to it when we lived there. We relaxed a bit and started talking again for a while. Then, a little later, other noises started happening. It sounded like something was being scooted across the floor in there. She was ready to leave again, but stated his request once more. The scooting noise changed to thumping that rattled the door violently for a while. She sat through all of that, looking scared but tolerating it. And then, things seemed to get quiet for a while, so we relaxed a bit again. After a few minutes though, there was a loud sound that sounded like someone dropped a book flat on the floor. We all jumped because of it. It was loud enough to startle us. She got up and said, that's it, I'm leaving. So she turned on the light and went right out to the car. He stayed with me so I didn't have to stay in the house alone. And she came back to pick him up the next morning. But before she got there, we went into the attic to see if there was any sign of what we heard in there. And the first thing that we noticed was the stack of encyclopedia was messed back up and one book was on the floor. And maybe I shouldn't have messed with the encyclopedias after all. So this is a weird story and I definitely made some stupid decisions but it was scary nonetheless. I'm male and a few years ago when I was 19, I was definitely a major shut-in and shy kid and was feeling pretty bored. I had just recently broke up with my high school girlfriend and I was lonely so I decided to join this online dating site and see where things went. A lot of people also use this site for friends and I definitely needed some friends so I just put on my profile that I was looking for friends and or dating 
and whatever happens, happens. I honestly don't know why I did this since I didn't have a car and couldn't transport myself easily to meet anyone. I think I just wanted to text people and BS around or get some attention because once again I was feeling lonely and bored. But this girl messaged me after a while though, Lily. Lily was actually my age and boy was she cute. We got to talking and she was also really funny, offbeat and had my same interest in making art. So she said that if I didn't mind, how about I go to her place that night to smoke, play video games and talk. I said I'd love to, but the problem was is that I don't have a car. She said that she had no issue picking me up, so I agreed. In the end, it actually turned out that Lily lived about an hour away and I tried backing out because, well, I felt bad about the distance, but she said that I could just give her some gas money. So then after that, we set the plans. When Lily picked me up, I was surprised because she looked nothing like her pictures, like a completely different person. This girl in my driveway was just, I hate to say it, but I wasn't attracted to her at all. I was actually quite shocked. She looked rough, like she was a heavy drug user, probably five years older as well, and all disheveled. I tried to mask my shock because I didn't want to be mean. I was awkward as hell and I had low self-esteem, so I didn't want to say a word about it. I stupidly got into the car with her as well, and she just didn't say a word about it either, which was really weird looking back. But Lily and I talked throughout the trip. And she was just as funny and friendly as she had been through text, so I figured everything would be okay. But we stopped at a store to pick up some things. I started having that, oh hell no, panic moment. And I tried to be cool about it by saying that I probably was just going to chill out. I'm not wanting to do that. I mean, there was no way I was going to sleep with her. I felt flattered by the attention because, once again, no self-esteem. But I was mildly freaked out, I admit. And she said no problem, so we just got some sodas and some swishes. We got to her house eventually though, and it was dark by this time. This place was definitely a trap house, obviously. I was freaked out, but also young and stupid. And I felt stuck because I had no transportation. I figured worse comes to worse, I'll just get a taxi because I have some money. On our way in though, she said something really weird. Hey, just so you know, I have five roommates and they're also going to be here. They're probably just going to be staring at you, but don't be worried. I think they'll like you. I don't know why, but that just sounded really strange to me. I didn't want to say though, so I just laughed it off. I walk in and there is just boxes and trash just stacked everywhere. There's five people, guys and girls. Three of them were sitting on the floor playing a video game. Two are sitting at a table. And sure enough, they all turned and looked sharply at me. But they didn't say a word. I just kind of stood there in the end. and I figured I must be acting nervous or shy like usual. But Lily introduced me and they just stared. We start talking about when they're going to smoke and she said that we have to wait for this dude to get back to her, that he'll probably be here in like 30 minutes and I can just chill in her room until then. For some reason, and I really don't remember why, I agreed. She put the TV on and I just waited in her room with the door shut for a long time. I felt like I wanted to leave but I had to stay. When finally Lily came back and we go to the kitchen and three new dudes are there. Again, they kind of just stare me down. All of these people looked equally or more rough than Lily. Just like when you see a meth user and you can automatically tell what's up. I didn't know if they were actually much older than me or if it was just their drug use or what, but boy, they looked a lot older than I was. Well into their 20s. I started talking about just random stuff. I don't even know what I said. They passed me the swisher though and they were very generous you could say and I smoked most of it. And I started feeling almost instantly weird straight after that. Like, straight away, I knew that it wasn't weed, but I had no idea what it was. I was hallucinating, the room was spinning, I started having awful paranoia and feeling like I was in a house full of literal zombies, felt like I was having a heart attack, and I really don't think that it was just potent weed because I've never had that intense horrible feeling in my entire life like that. 
I tried to say something, but they acted like it was funny, and so I told Lily that I was going to go to her room or something. I don't know what. I think that I went to her room, though, and I laid down on a bed. It was cold in there, which helped, and I laid down on my back just staring at the ceiling fan spinning. I thought that I was going to get murdered, and I tried to keep telling myself that it was all just paranoia. I'm not sure how long I was in there, but eventually I got up. I went back into the living room. Lots of people are still there, and some people were playing a video game. I sat on the floor, tried not to pass out on the floor, and glued my eyes to the screen. It did help a little bit until some of her friends started taking out questionable small bags of curious substance. And that's when I started thinking, okay, screw this, I'm out. I got up immediately and Lily grabbed my hand and took me back to her room. I said that I feel really weird and I need to lie down again. She laid down with me and I said that I actually need to leave now. Like, let's go right now, please take me home. She started laughing and said that I had to stay. It's too late to take me all the way back to my house. I told her that I was panicking. I'm freaking out. I don't want to be here. I've got to leave right now. Let's go. I started saying a lot of weird stuff as well and I don't really remember what it was. Then somebody else came into the room. One dude that I recognized as being one of her roommates. They started talking and my ears were just ringing and all I could think about was that I needed to leave. The guy tapped me on the shoulder and tried to convince me to stay and asked what my problem was. I just pushed past him and stumbled out into the living room. The other people ask where I'm going. Lily comes back and now she's all pissed off asking me what the hell I think I'm doing. I told her that I was leaving though. I knew it wasn't the best choice since I could barely see straight. I could barely speak coherently but every alarm bell in my head was going off. Every siren, every red flag that you could think of. I honestly just felt like something bad was about to happen if I stayed there any longer. Lily told me good luck getting home because we're not driving you. I didn't respond as I left and she screamed at the door that I better not call the cops. I had no intention of calling the cops. I just wanted to go home if I'm being honest. I walked and walked down the street until I couldn't see the houses anymore. I was looking over my shoulder constantly checking because I was convinced that they were watching me. It was probably just the paranoia but... Who knows? I started panicking about the taxi because suddenly I had way less money than I thought. I had set my stuff down so I started thinking that Lily and her junkie friends must have stolen my money. And just then I remembered that my stepsister told me to call her if I ever needed a ride. From anywhere basically and she wouldn't ask questions. So I called her and I gave her this crazy rambling hard to comprehend story and said that I needed her to pick me up if she could. I gave her the address of a random house that I was sitting on the sidewalk in front of. Not the best decision either but I sat there in front of the house for like 30 or 40 minutes waiting, laid down on the sidewalk and finally she got there. I'm lucky she was able to help me out because I'm not sure what I would have done otherwise. I went right to sleep when I got home and I felt woozy when I woke up the next morning but much better than I had the night before. And after that, I blocked Lily's number and deleted my account from the website. I'm really glad that nothing bad ended up happening to me that night and I'm glad that I was lucid enough to leave and get a ride home. Because of this too and other stories that I've heard, I'm very wary of dating apps and sites these days. There are some great people on there, of that I'm sure, but you just never know if somebody is who they actually say they are. I graduated high school in 2010 and due to a very abusive and manipulative father was told that I was no longer welcome to stay at home. My mother, having taken so many meds that she could hardly remember what day it was, had decided to take my father's side in the decision to kick me out. And without an actual job, I was left to find another place to live. I had at that time recently re-established communication with a cousin of mine who had lost contact with the family for various reasons and had arranged to be their live-in babysitter or roommate. My cousin was married to an old hippie and had two children of her own, a boy and a girl, as well as her husband having shared custody of his daughter every other week. The kids were all under the age of six and were very smart. 
It's important to let you know too that my cousin, for the most part, was a good mother in the sense that she made sure her kids were fed and well behaved. She didn't let them watch scary movies or dress up in anything too terrifying for Halloween. And when I say scary movies, I mean not even the old Mickey Mouse episodes where the Disney gang hunts down goats. And due to this, none of the kids had any issues going to bed or having nightmares. Until I moved in. For those of you who don't know, hauntings, demons, evil spirits, will mock the Holy Trinity at times by using the number three. And so, we can finally get onto the good part now. So during the third week of my short time living with my cousins, I found myself suffering from a bit of insomnia, as I usually do, and to pass the time was on the phone with other fellow insomniacs deep into the night. At 3.15am, my cousin's daughter, who is named Anna, wakes up screaming. I end the call with my friend and rush upstairs to find out what the hell happened. I enter the girl's room to find Anna sitting upright in her bed, crying and terrified. Oh, I saw a ghost in my parents' room. Oh, oh, honey, it's okay. Ghosts aren't real. You must have just had a bad dream. I'm a believer, but I couldn't tell that to a five-year-old, right? But, but I saw it. Well, would you like me to sit by your bed until you fall asleep again? Yeah. So I tuck her back into bed and I sit down next to her, texting my Samsung Duke, also known as the Kit Kat, because of its small shape and color, and after about five minutes, Anna sits back up and points to the foot of her bed and says, There's a shadow at the end of my bed. I get up and pull my phone out and shine the light from the screen and say, Look, there isn't anything here, as a cold blast of air shoots right through me. Shaken but calm, I say, see? And go to sit back down. Anna lays back down and goes to sleep. I get up to go to my room to try to sleep as well. But right as I'm about to doze off, Anna wakes up screaming her lungs out again. I rush into her, saying, There are red eyes coming from the clothes and toys on my floor. I pick everything up from the floor and place the small pile of stuff in the closet. I must mention too that the room also had a nightlight which I also then repositioned on the girl's dresser to provide more light to the room and after getting her to calm down again and her falling back to sleep, I once again returned to my room to try to sleep again. And for the third time, Anna woke up crying. However, upon entering her room and being told that they're behind the dresser, I tried to check as my cousin who had been asleep all this time had finally woken up and burst into the door asking what was happening. I tell her, Well, uh, your daughter keeps saying that she's seeing ghosts. My cousin takes her daughter into her room to sleep with mummy and daddy for the night as I, a very terrified and tired 18 year old, decide that sleep can wait until morning and went downstairs to watch TV until dawn. Anna joined me not too shortly afterward and didn't say a single thing other than a brief, can I stay down here with you? In the morning, my cousin approaches me to ask about what happened that night and I tell her everything that I know about ghosts and the research that I've been doing since middle school and to the other side. She asks if she should question her daughter about what she saw and I cautioned against it as acknowledging a presence is usually the reason why activity escalates. So she drops the subject. And the next night, at 3.15am, I wake up again to the sound of Anna crying. I walk into her room and immediately ask, Did you see another ghost? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go and get your mum, alright? After waking up my cousin and her husband and having them come to console a very distraught five-year-old, I went back to my room, shaken that this has now happened twice in two nights at the exact same time trying to get back to sleep. With my door cracked about an inch or two and from where my bed was positioned, I can clearly see down the hall as my cousin led her daughter to their room and shut the bedroom door. I can hear the muffled sounds of my cousin and her husband comforting her daughter and then, as if Anna had been standing just outside my bedroom door, I heard her voice call out, loud and clear, in a questioning tone. Dad? Followed by the crack of one of Anna's plastic teacups being hurled against the wall as if it had been thrown at a considerable force. 
I immediately grab my MP3 player and shove my headphones in tighter than I ever had and for the first time since I was a child, pulled the blankets up over my head. And what happened next will forever haunt me and still gives me the goosebumps when I talk about it. Have you ever closed your eyes and just sort of stared into your eyelids? You can kind of see the dancing specks of the color there. Well, this was not that. As I lay there, headphones in, eyes closed, trying to forget what had been happening, this thing that I can only describe as looking like a cross between a witch and a vampire with wispy hair and razor sharp teeth outlined in a bright white, jumped at me from the invisible horizon behind my eyelids and outstretched arms and claws and grabbed for me. I sat straight up in bed and opened my eyes to try and escape the thing and as I did, it physically hurt to open my eyes and sit up. It was honestly as if something had just attacked me and wanted me to stay in the dark. After about an hour of praying and willing whatever dark spirits to leave me alone, I was finally able to sleep. In the morning, my cousin had taken their kids to spend the day with their grandparents and upon her return, once again approached me on the previous night's events. She told me, so I kind of asked about what Anna's been seeing, even after I advised against it. Well, when I took the kids to their grandparents, Anna told me that she came into our room last night and she saw a shadow hovering over my face. This is when she shows me three scratch marks down her cheek as well. I actually woke up to this as well, so I thought that it would be best to ask. What did Anna say? Well, I asked her what it was that was scaring her at night, and whether or not the ghosts that she was seeing were angels, or if the things that she was seeing were scaring her. Anna told me that they scare her, and when I asked why, she said, There's two of them. They watch Sister. She called cousin's husband's daughter, sister, when she sleeps, and that they have big eyes and no mouths. This sent chills down my spine, and I cautioned my cousin once again that talking about this stuff would only bring more, and eventually she just dropped the subject. I brought in a friend who claimed to be able to communicate with spirits, and without telling him anything about the situation... He was able to tell me that there were in fact two spirits in that house. I wish that I had more, but this is pretty much where the activity ended. I moved out and into my own place a few months later without further incident. However, my brother, who moved in with my cousin shortly after I left, had experiences with noises and things moving when everyone was asleep or not home. I do have some other stories about other encounters with the paranormal, but this story ends here. And I hope that you can all sleep well after listening. This story happened a while back when I used to work as a front desk receptionist for a private hospital. That implied people coming straight to me when they entered the building. I remember one day, a mother came to the hospital with a baby in the stroller. I love babies, so while her mother would sign up the papers she needed for the doctor's appointment, I would make faces and sounds for the baby to behave and laugh. This made the mother smile at me. After maybe three to five minutes, the mother asks me if it would be possible for me to keep an eye on her baby as she needed to go to the bathroom real quick. I agreed, pulling the stroller inside of my booth near the door of the booth so mama can take it out easily. I did this for two reasons as well. One, to have the baby safe. And two, so that I could also do my work as my boss wouldn't take kindly on us slacking off work, no matter what the reasons. This baby too was absolutely beautiful. It was a gorgeous baby boy. Blue eyes, red hair and freckles. The kind of baby you see on a commercial, if I'm being honest. And as soon as Mama goes to the bathroom and I pull the baby inside my booth, another woman comes in with no appointment. She mumbles about wanting to make one, asks a lot of questions about the hospital, the services, anything you could easily find on the internet. I play professional and I give her all the information that she needed. She sees some merchandise in my booth with the hospital logo, flyers, pens, maps, caps, all that sort of stuff. And she asks me if she could have any. I say sure and turn my back to grab the stuff and when I turn back at her to give her the merchandise, 
I see that she came around my booth at the doorway, snatched the baby, and was now walking in front of my booth, not fast, trying maybe not to look suspicious. I see this and immediately scream for the guard as I climb on my booth and lunge at her, grabbing her to immobilize her. The security guard was not far away, but in his defense, he was on the other side of the building when the baby's mother came in, so he didn't know how she looked like. He grabs the baby, hands him to me, picks up the woman, who was now screaming out of her lungs, he's my baby, my baby, she stole my baby, towards me, also spitting at the security guard. Lucky enough, the baby's mama comes out of the bathroom, only to see her baby outside of this stroller, crying in my arms and a crazy woman shouting how the baby is hers. The mother runs to me, takes her baby back with tears in her eyes, asking what happened, and thanking both me and the guard for saving her baby. The police were called, they came and took the woman in, but to be quite honest, I think they took her to a mental hospital because after being caught, the woman just made no sense, was very aggressive, and would try to hurt anyone who even touched her. I'm really thankful and happy the security guard was there that day because if it wasn't for him, I couldn't have been able to take back the baby from this baby snatcher myself. To all the mums out there too, please never leave your babies unsupervised, even if the worker is willing to help and even loves babies, because you just never know what could happen. Every day when I came back from school, my mum would always say hello when I got to my room and then we usually would have a little chat about how my day was, etc. In the hallway that I go through to my room, there's an attic at the top with a door at the roof. So, like two weeks ago, I got a call from my mum at 6am and she told me that she wouldn't be home until like 12 o'clock or something. It was a normal day, but when I got home, I felt that something was just off, but... I didn't think too much about it, and I just went upstairs, aiming for my room. But when I got up there, the door to the attic was open, which was weird because we never go up there. So when I went into the room, I kind of picked up to see if there was anything up there. I'm pretty paranoid. And when I look up, I froze. Because there she was, hanging on a noose and having no signs of life in her. I stood there for about 10 minutes just staring at her until I started screaming and crying. Then, I must have gone unconscious because the next thing that I remember was my mum peeking over me asking me if I was okay. I was lying on the floor in front of the attic still with tears in my eyes when I heard my mum talking to me and looking at me. Then, I got up and looked to the attic and it was closed. I then told my mum everything, and when I said the thing about the attic, she told me that she actually opened it this morning. To this day, I have no idea what I saw up there, but it still gives me nightmares. So to begin this, I want to make a few points just so that I can get them out of the way. Me nor my family do any type of drugs. There are no wolves in Pennsylvania, but they've been extinct here for like a hundred years or over that. My hometown is next to Philadelphia too, so it's not like super rural. There have recently been coyote sightings, but like 30 minutes away from here, and they're actually coyote dog hybrids. And last but not least, it was canine, not a bobcat or anything of that sort. Okay, so on with the story. So a few months ago, I was visiting my girlfriend's house. She lives right near a creek and the area is wooded. Now, her street is a one-way street. There's no loop or turn or anything. It ends right at the creek. And after spending the day with her, my mum and dad came to pick me up with my two dogs. My mum called me to tell me that they were here and I could hear my dogs barking and growling. I asked what they were barking at and my mum said that she couldn't tell but something was sitting at the end of her street about 50 feet from her house. I gave her a hug and exchanged goodbyes and went to walk out forgetting about the thing that they said was there and calling my dog's name to calm them down but they just didn't. In fact, they got more aggressive with whatever was at the end as if they were trying to protect me. Then, all of a sudden, my mum yells at me to hurry because there was something there that was pretty scary. I ran to the car and got in and asked what happened. Everyone was pale and shaking and then they told me what was up. 
So when I walked out of my girl's house, the floodlights turned on and illuminated the area where the thing was. And they said that it was a big, dark, furred dog-like thing. It looked like my small American Eskimo dog, but way bigger and black fur. They said it was just sitting there, but when I walked out and called my dogs, its head jerked in my direction and it had what looked like the eyes of a human and a terrified look like it didn't want to be seen. Then it got off of all fours and its legs were bent like a canine's, but then they straightened like a human. It then bent its knees and took a massive leap into the woods. And when I mean massive, I mean like at least 30 feet. I'm actually from Mexico, and my dad was raised in Mexico City, but from generation to generation, old Aztec lore was passed down. I sometimes would ask my dad what we saw, and he'd get super uncomfortable and didn't like to talk about it. The day that we saw it, I kept on hearing him say something, and I was confused because what he was saying means water, so I thought it was the creek or something. It was hard to hear with my dogs barking and my mum and little sister freaking out. So I asked again recently and asked him why he said those things. What he said sent shivers down my spine. He said to me, I didn't actually say water. I said, it's a shaman who can take the form of an animal by wearing its pelt. However, they can be good or bad depending on the person apparently. The fact that this canine thing was human in ways is what made him think of that. My dad strongly believes that we stumbled upon the person as it was finishing up transforming. That's why it was so frightened to see us since that we would know who it was. I never mentioned it to my girlfriend until about two months ago because, well, honestly, I thought that she'd think that I was crazy. I told her and she didn't think that. In fact, she mentioned that it may not have been that at all but connected to something Native American since literally lots of our town is built over old Native burial grounds. She also mentioned that her dog is scared to go and pee outside and barks at apparently nothing when they do take him. Since then too, we just kind of forgot about the whole thing. Until one day when we were watching YouTube, and the episode that we were watching was on scary things caught on camera in the woods and whatnot. The video that the guy was talking about was supposed to be skinwalkers and that reminded her of the situation. She explained to me that at her school, her friends were talking about paranormal and other encounters. They went around the table talking and, you know, the usual ghost and UFO stuff. One of her friends talked about white magic and crystals and whatnot, but the two people before her had something wild to tell. So they're both those kind of people that like going on walks in the woods and playing music, meditating and that sort of stuff. They have a clearing that they usually go to and they were walking to it. And when they got there, they heard a heavy panting and what they described as a painful twisting of bones and ripping sounds. They were obviously worried about what could be there, like maybe an injured deer, so they walked down to alarm it. When they got to the clearing, though, they saw a massive dog with pointy ears, waddling awkwardly and then just straight up walking like a human. They were freaked out and frozen in fear because what they saw didn't have paws on its front or hind legs just very hairy hands and feet with untrimmed sickly yellow nails. The boy of the two panicked and stepped back, making some leaves rustle. The creature's head had turned so fast that they screamed when they saw it. It once again looked alarmed and dropped on all fours and took a jump, and they just heard the heavy trotting of all fours grow distant from them as they then sprinted back towards the trail and to the strip of the mall that was close by. I thought at first that she was just messing with me until I saw that she was actually scared. She never mentioned my encounter to any of them as well, as it was going to be the thing that she was going to tell us a story, apart from how her grandmother's Ouija board creeps her out. There's a little bit more to this story too involving this creature, but I have to clock in for work for now. I work in a hospital as a dietary aide, so it's important that I clock in on time, but I'll update this after work or tomorrow, so if you're interested, I'll be back soon. But feel free to leave a comment too and to leave some ideas on what this could be. I know for a fact though that it's not a regular wolf because they're just not in PA or coyote too because it's just too big. It's definitely not a bear as well because it looks canine. But anyway, I'll try to answer as many questions as I can. Thanks for listening.
So this story is going to be a bit painful for me to share, but I want to share this story with the hope that I can educate and possibly prevent anyone from ever touching a Ouija board. So the year is 2016. I'm 16 years old and I live in a small town in Michigan. I play football for my high school and I'm pretty good. Also, I am 6'3", so I already have interest for football from small colleges. I have a girlfriend for the first time in my life and I'm from a very rough home, so I'm barely ever there except to sleep. So Friday night rolls around and my girlfriend invites me over to a friend's house to just hang out and whatnot. As the night went on, my girlfriend and a friend pulled out a Ouija board and started going to town on it. But the friend of my girlfriend starts going on about how she thinks she's talking to a dead grandmother on the board and so, me being a Catholic who hadn't been to church in like five years, says verbatim, you are not talking to your dead grandmother, you're talking to a demon you dumbass. And nothing else really happened that night, besides me walking five miles home while I'm drinking. Yes, I was an awful kid, plus I'm Mexican, so the amount of alcohol I can consume is enough to kill a mammoth. That following week, though, I decided to take a nap for an hour after school. My alarm wakes me up, and I sit up in bed, and my closet just opens by itself. Not like a gust of wind, too, but as if someone had just kicked it from the inside. And immediately, I lay eyes on the blackest shadow that I have ever seen come darting out at me, and I blinked and... It was gone, but the closet was still open, so I know that I didn't imagine it. The next night, too, I dream about a tall horned monster. At the time, I didn't know that I perfectly described a demon, but that had just the most disgusting-looking face I've ever seen, as if it was rotten, but at the same time, creature-like, while well, at the same time being like 12 feet tall. It spoke to me in an awful evil sounding voice and said how it hated me because I automatically knew that it was a demon mimicking my friend's deceased grandmother, as well as saying how since I was Catholic, I was doomed to go to hell and all this sort of stuff. The next three weeks, I was proceeded to be what I can only describe as being assaulted in dreams by this entity. I've struggled with that detail of this story till this day. It wore me down and I started gaining weight rapidly. I went from 220 pounds to 290 pounds in 8 months. My girlfriend of 9 months left me on New Year's Eve, accusing me of cheating when I come to find out that she had already been fooling around with my buddy on the football team and started dating him the next week that she dumped me. And the night that I was dumped on New Year's Eve, I dreamt of that entity dragging me out of bed all the way to my basement where it showed me all of these pentagrams on the wall in blood, and it just laughed in a very deep voice and then said something that I'll never forget. It said, Heard about your piece of pussy leaving you. I wonder how hard she's getting drilled now. I woke up and I instantly cried. I finally reached out to my uncle, who is actually a priest, and had him bless me in my house, and to this day, nothing has ever happened to me since. My uncle has done a lot of exorcisms, so he told me everything to know about the demonic and how they work and how to beat them into submission and whatnot. I only shared this story in case someone can relate or wants to listen. I also have no mental illness and I don't take any drugs, nor does my family, so I know that I'm not crazy or lying. But honestly, sometimes I wish that I was. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and if you would like to help me out, then please go ahead and watch another video by clicking on a card on the screen. As always guys, thanks for all the love and support and I'll see you mates in the next one.